consultants. I'm here today to talk to you about project development, more specifically in relation to transformative living labs in the area of mobility. The important characteristics of a living lab project normally focus on three different goals. On the first hand, we have the innovation, where we're talking about developing new products and processes in order to find new solutions to existing or new problems. On the other hand, we're talking about the knowledge development for replication. It's very important to mention that the intention of a living lab is not to produce a result that cannot later on be replicated and commercialized. And finally, it's also important to mention that we're talking about increasing the urban sustainability. So the intention of a living lab is to ensure that the results are actually sustainable beyond the time of the specific project that is taking place. On the other hand, in relation to the activities, I and mean, an in innovative living lab should cover all of the phases of the innovation process. So we're talking about research, we're talking about development, testing, implementation and commercialization, meaning also the replication. So in this sense, in terms of development and innovation, Living labs really aim to develop an innovation and not only to test or implement a pre-developed solution. Secondly, we're talking about co-creation. So it's very important that all of the stakeholders that could either be affected or that has a decision power are taken into consideration already from the beginning of the process. Lastly, we're talking about iteration between activities. So the feedback gathered throughout the living lab process, meaning both use and the evaluation of the innovation that has been demonstrated, is later on evaluated in terms of its results. Um, and in that case, it is possible to actually evaluate if it's necessary to later on fine tune the specific product or process that has been developed and tested. Thirdly, we're talking about the different participants. It's very important that all Living Lab stakeholders are included from the start of the project in order to arrive at this co-created and integrated solutions that Living Labs really propagate. This requires the initiating partners of the lab to already from the beginning on actively invite public, private, civic, and knowledge stakeholders. So we're talking about the end users, meaning in many cases in, in urban living labs, we're talking about the citizens, we're talking about the private actors, which can many times be the companies that operate on an urban level. We're talking about knowledge institutes, me meaning either the research organizations, the university, the technology institutes. And finally, we're talking about also the public actors. So it's important to always take into consideration those that create the legis legislative framework in order for your living lab to operate. Of course, we can never forget about other types of stakeholders. Each living lab requires different, different types of stakeholders. And many times it could be useful to look into specific clusters, associations, and, and ensure their involvement in order to gather all of the stakeholders in the same place. Now, a living lab, both that proposal and project execution phase is managed really in eight steps. And the rest of my presentation will be looking into each of these steps. First step is the initiation. So we're talking about either an idea or a problem. The first step in really establishing a living lab um, is the initiation. Living labs are aimed at generating innovations at either aimed at a problem or an idea that has already arisen through um, the identification of a specific issue that could be solved. So when starting from a problem, the actions lie in making the problem very explicit and finding partners that agree with you on the relevance of solving this problem to initiate a living lab. Now, an idea is another way for a possible solution to follow uh, later, for example, following a research phase or a brainstorming session. So in other cases, an idea can also serve as a starting point for a living lab, emerging either from a private search for a solution to a problem. Making the connection between the idea and the relevant problem, that is really the key in this initiation, pro uh, this initiation process. So based on an idea, a living lab with other interested stakeholders can actually be set up. In terms of partners, 
it is up to the person or the specific stakeholder that comes up with the idea or the problem to identify the partners who are interested in collaborating on elaborating the topic or the idea. So initiator is really the one that has to reach out to potential partners to form a partnership from the beginning on. And if this person needs to have the capacity to set up a project. So when in contact, it's the task of this initiator to persuade and motivate the potential partners to collaborate on the topic of the suggested either idea or problem. Now, it is very important to motivate each of the stakeholders. It is not sufficient just to speak from your own necessity and your own interest. You are talking about co-creation, so ensure that whoever stakeholders you wish to involve in this process are actually stakeholders that share the same problem, the same interest, but they might not have the same explicit interest as, as you have. So just a couple of tips. Similar thinkers are the carriers of ideas. So many times the living labs and the ideas for living labs can actually arise through uh, meetings, through events where you gather people with different backgrounds, with different profiles, but all discussing the same idea. It is very interesting many times to work with an already existing community. And I think again, here we're going back to the aspects of the clusters and the associations. And again, if there is the possibility, we believe it could be quite interesting to connect your idea to an already existing, potentially subsidized project, or to find suitable funding programs that might be able to fund your idea. And that can also be a way to motivate all of the different stakeholders to really get involved in the entire process. Now, when we're talking about the project as such, after determining the topic of the living lab and finding the partners who are actually willing to collaborate on this topic, it's necessary to translate this very abstract idea into a concrete project in which all of the interested partners can really participate and can constri constructively work on this problem. Going to the second phase, which is the plan of development. So during the project planification, a stage of plan development comes into play in which the direction of the development of the pro product as well as the processes are determined. So during this process, it's extremely important to have a shared vision of what will really happen. So again, a living lab approach implies that not only the first phase, but also the plan, the development is really done through a co-creation phase. So it's really done jointly with all of the stakeholders involved in this process. When you go into finding the right capabilities, it's extremely important to understand all of the aspects of your idea and your project and your living lab. Don't just focus on the research. Don't just focus on the demonstration. You need to focus on the whole picture to ensure that you involve all of the stakeholders necessary. You might be able to need to involve somebody with the expertise on the local level on the legis legislative aspects. You might be uh, interested in involving somebody specifically interested in the social innovation aspects to ensure that you can also involve the uh, the local stakeholders. So when the vision is set and the capabilities and actors are really included, it's it's the perfect timing for creating the uh, the process decision. In this sense, when we're talking about a product design, it's self-evident in, in the innovation processes, but sometimes it is forgotten when we're talking about specific processes and we're talking about a living lab. So in this sense, it's important that during this entire phase, you pay a special attention to the workflow, the equipment needs to the methods and the planning of the activities and the vision of the roles and the sp and responsibilities amongst the different living lab participants and of course across the entire innovation life cycle and the entire living lab. So in this sense we are really also trying to see how can you ensure the participation of all of these participants? And again, coming back to the funding, try and pay a special attention to it as the sharing of cost 
is always a challenging issue when we're talking about dividing the task and responsibilities. And the stakeholders often decide to share the cost or to actually contribute in kind in order to reduce the financial risk. So in this sense, start looking and applying for subsidies already early in the process could also be quite a good way of promoting a living lab. Now, after that, you also need to ensure the appropriate process management. Now, a visionary leader has a very large positive impact on innovation processes. So always ensure you have a leader who truly believes in the idea and who truly understands the perspective of all of the perspectives of the idea. And as of that point, you can really create a management structure that ensures that you have covered all of the interests from all of the stakeholders involved. Now, step three is a co-creative design. It is very important to achieve the right mindset. So you have the network collaboration in the setting of equal interest based on trust and in which uncertainties are create are confronted together. So in that sense, of course, innovation is so can always be risky business. But if you're doing it all together, try and understand the insecurities of the other stakeholders. You might be convinced you might, might feel secure, but sometimes some of the stakeholders might very often need a bit more convincing and a bit more support in order to feel comfortable, uh, confident to push forward. So this would also create the ideal positive and inspiring co-creation co session for the design phase and also try to avoid the typical hierarchical actor dominance in the development process and leave everybody provide their opinion and ideas. So maintain an open and transparent attitude um, and furthermore, also importantly, try to identify those regulations that hinder your experiment, but also those that support it, and then go in and experiment and focus on those. There are certain legislative and regulations that you cannot change in one moment from the other. Now, working with the public stakeholders, you can consult with them if there is a possibility to actually change something or if there is not. Now, Proceeding to step four, the specific implementation. Now, in the Living Lab approach, design activities are often with implementation of the product or the service as such in its real life environment. So in this process, it's very important that you ensure that you can sustain the implement innovation throughout time. So in this sense, it is a, for example, very important that the roles that are necessary for the implementation of innovation are taking up only by actors who would also take up those roles in the long term so that fits with their daily activities. Don't request stakeholders to take on activities and tasks that they do not usually do because first of all they might lose interest and second of all if there is a change of employees you certainly have nobody that can support you. So also on the other hand you would have the option of actually formalizing an implementation organization if your local environment would need this for building trust. Now, in most projects, this is not considered necessary, but including the correct st stakeholders in the management of the collaboration, that is extremely important under every circumstance. When you go into step five, the evaluation as such. So the ev evaluation is a core component of the Living Lab approach. During the evaluation phase, the product and the process are evaluated to check whether the goals or the ambitions have actually been achieved. So this evaluation is to take place at two levels. You have the technical level, which is very much concerned on the functioning on the innovation itself. And then afterwards, you also need to make yourself your question on the second level as so at a conceptual level, does, is the evaluation actually concerned with the questioning of the, has it led to the right innovation? Has it led to solving the problem that I was looking into? Uh, does it uh, have many perhaps unexpected side effects? Would it actually be possible to replicate it beyond my own local environment? And if so, 
under which condition and at which scale. So the monitoring and evaluation activities need to be specifically formulated and steered by the management of the living lab, usually in the case of urban living labs. So you have the public stakeholders such as local authorities, and also many times the subsidized organizations. They would also like to be involved in this monitoring and evaluation process, especially to see have we actually um, invested in something that has later on resulted as a success. So this is extremely important to make a, the evaluation easy by good preparation and also do not forget to include the external users in the, in the evaluation with this in, when this is considered relevant. Many times you might have a vision of what you're doing, but asking somebody externally might give you completely an entirely different input that you initially expected. Now going on to step seven, dissemination. So it's very important to reflect on what you have done and draw lessons for, from what you have done. And not just draw them, but also document them. So write them into either white papers, best practices documents. So try afterwards and really think about how can I create something that I can pass on to other people so they can understand the lessons from what we have learned. So it's very important to generalize the lessons and contextualize what you have been doing, especially for sharing it on a later stage. So all projects really have to make a big effort in disseminating the results and the conclusions. And again, or involving all of the stakeholders. All of the stakeholders have their own networks to reach out to. Otherwise, you might be focusing the dissemination on just one type of stakeholder. So make sure that everybody is involved in this process and make sure that the lessons are accessible to all types of public and all types of stakeholders. And finally, going on to step Eight, which of course looks into the replication. So the final step in a successful living lab really is the uh, replication, referring to the reproduction of the developed innovation in other, in this case, urban context. So replication does not occur unless somebody really decides to do this. So this decision can either come from two sides, either it's the innovation generating living lab that really wants to scale the results um, and through and enlarging them to other um, to other locations, but it could also be that through this previous dissemination phase that you have done, you have actually caught the attention of some external actors who could be interested in replicating your innovation and really want to adopt the solution. So it's very important that when you replicate the innovation, when you try and implement it in other contexts, of course, you have to go through the entire co-creation process again. So the entire process that I have just commented on, it, you need to involve again all of the stakeholders and really start from scratch by basing yourself upon the best lessons that you can have learned from this process. This will create an environment where you can sustain the innovation beyond time. And that is really what everybody wishes to obtain through a living lab project. So all there is left from my side is to wish you all the best of luck. And of course, I put myself at your availability for any types of questions or doubts that you might have. Bye-bye.